10 o'clock. So, thank you everybody for coming here for this, uh, how can I call it, experiment. But hackathon are experiments. Some people, Onerva. <laughs> Some people ask me, I don't really know what's a hackathon. I don't really understand what's a hackathon. I hope after this to understand it. My definition is that a hackathon I'm is... Okay, sorry. <laughs> but anyway, to give a definition of a hackathon is that an amount of time that you dedicate for yourself to learn something new. Okay, so this is like a very broad definition. In practice, what usually happens in hackathon is that there's some existing tools, software, and there's some existing data, and often this software and this data have never been you know, put together, so the hacking is that, you know, without wasting too much time and going straight to the, you know, you kind of put, take the data that has never gone through the software and just shuffle it through and then see, does it make sense? Does it make sense? Can we get something useful out of it? So then, of course, in hackathons, in brain hackathons, there's also um, educational talks, and some people might have their own projects, and they want to, you know, for example, many hackathons, they wrote uh, documentation for um, open source projects and stuff like that. So we will talk more about the hackathon part later, after lunch. But now, to get us all inspired, we have some unconference talk, because in hackathons, you know, it's all informal. So we will have, it's not a conference, it's an unconference. And we're going to start with Rita Hari, that is going to kind of, you know, challenge our thoughts a bit on about the unsolved problems in neuroscience. I guess you all know who is Rita Hari. If you need me to tell you who is Rita Hari, maybe this is not the place for you. <laughs> yeah, such kids go. Don't worry, no pressure. I can tell you later. At <laughs> okay, thanks a lot, Enrico. And this oh. is live uh, streaming on Twitter. So whatever you say, somebody will hear it. Some, yeah. Okay. <coughs> Welcome here. And uh, so I'm going to speak uh, with this title that we know about the brain almost everything except how it works. With the words by Rodolfo Folinas, who is a neuroscientist originally in New York. And certainly there's time to think. It's there's of course always time to think. But at present we know that the data experimental data, they're increasing much faster than is our understanding of the brain as a, in whole, or even a small part of that. And then if we start to think about what questions <coughs> to ask, there certainly are too many unsolved questions. You can go to different levels because it's a question of what level should we try to understand the brain. If we try to understand it at somehow at the system level and the human behavior, so it could be something like how do we experience and share our common world? How do we come, become conscious? How can we react so fast with our very slow brains? And how do we think, categorize, navigate, converse? I could continue this list. There are books which are telling something like 23 unsolved problems in neuroscience. Wikipedia lists lots of these problems. But in problems, there's always there are good problems and bad problems. And uh, I think good way to think is along these wise words by novelist Peter Medovar, who says that science is the art of the soluble. So that if there's a difficulty of the task, so there's some very easy questions they are not interesting as such because the results are trivial. Don't waste your time there. Then there are very difficult questions. I think many consciousness-related questions are on this side, right? although we, one can tackle them as well. Notice, somehow you work a long time, you don't get anything out of that. It's better to be in this so-called metaverse zone where they are, questions are interesting enough but solvable. And then, <clears throat> so I have three notes. This was already my uh, uh, first note. And then I have six questions, which are larger questions than typically what you see. Somehow, maybe more conceptual one. <clears throat> first is, since you are working with the data, I think it's always good to think what kind of data do you have, especially big data. Because if we compare, for example, think about physics, 
experiments. So uh, typically there's a very good theory behind and there's been lots of analysis and then hypothesis done before the large set of data are collected. So the analysis of oh, some kind of theory precedes data collection. And if we think about neuroscience data, especially the big data sets, so what is done? Every, every lab has done their own experiments. Maybe they are a little bit similar as in the other labs. And then they are combined. And then comes a person who has uh, skills in the computing, starts to play with the data. Okay, that's nice. Maybe at least the, what we can do is the new tools to start. <laughs> To, to, <coughs> to study signals, complex signals, but whether they really tell the, them us something, it's a question. And another thing is that much of our current information comes from animal experiments. And we know that there are about 8 million different species in the, in the, on the Earth. So are we using the best species out of this Eight million. And there's a <clears throat> so how have, have been these animals who are studied selected? And there's a, such a quite a disappointment, disappointing statement in a paper uh, last year in in by Yartsev in Science that says that standard laboratory model systems, that means the animals, were not originally <coughs> chosen for any particular specialized function or specific behavioral trait but rather for their breeding patterns and ease of maintenance in, in these <coughs> hospitals and um, in these research institutes, which were important for fields such as genetics and developmental biology. So people are using animals that are easy, cheap, and uh, <coughs> somehow easy to breed. And <coughs> <coughs> then there are certain animals that has been used a lot Squids have been used for studies of action potentials because they have so big neurons. Then frogs have been used for studies of synaptic transmission because they say that their synapses are quite big. It's easy to study. Then lateral inhibition, retinal physiology has been studied for example, host of crabs because it's somehow it's easy to access those areas. And then we know that there's a Nobel Prize given even about learning and memory and in Aplusia. Again, because this uh, small animal snail has su such a simple forms of learning and reacting. And then rats have been used for studies of spatial representation because again, they have been quite easy to breed. And then also their behavior is suitable because they have lots of exploring behavior. And there are now such animals which are come increasing in popularity, zebrafish, mouse and marmosets. And for example, we can criticize the use of mouse as an analog for human cognition. Mice are quite a blind, they're almost blind. And many, many things, they, their cognition is not like our cognition. Rats are in that sense much better. And then there are some animals which are decreasing popular in rats, cats, ferret, macaque. Okay, so these were my background notes. And then I will have uh, six different questions or problems. And one is to really remedi uh, remediate this problem that we are just getting lots and lots of data and not real good theory is that I think everybody should think about functional principles behind brain function. And then the good way to start is from evolution. And then think the smallest animals and whatever. And the brain certainly it has evolved in the real world. So the real world properties are somehow reflected there. And to di displace the organism, which is an embodied agent. So it moves the body. And of course, brains are like predicting the future on the basis of the past. So that means that memory as such is also directly to the future. In a way, one can say in a bold way, um, that action is the boss. Perception, adaptation, thinking, etc. are servants in the evolution for that. So think in, in, in the vocabulary of actions. So then during this long evolution, 
our species, we have um, got multiple simplifying priors. So there's lots of knowledge about the world in our brains. And though that knowledge then makes our actions much more fast and easy. They, they automatize some of them. Over the years, every day, sun is, okay, of course, sun is not rising, but we are going around the sun, but it doesn't matter. It seems to us like sun is rising and the height is different at different times of the, of the year. So circadian rhythms, daily rhythms are everywhere in our metabolism and in sleep cycle. Then we have annual rhythms and many animals have them very clearly. Then we know that somehow we know automatically that light comes from above and that so we assume it to come from sun and that's why we perceive this strange illusion. Just exactly the same shading in all these circles but turned around by 180 degrees and the perception changes because we think that the light comes from sun. We are fighting against gravity. I try to fight against it all the time. When I know how it affects me. <laughs> and then there are, so also there are lots of like movement laws, even like uh, one could say like a Newton's laws or mechanics, they are somehow already imprinted to our brains. And the third thing here is that the brain is never isolated. So this is also something important to remember. It's always connected to the world and to the body. And through motor commands and then sensory input and then some prediction uh, and uh, comparison mechanisms here. And then this is important, what is here outside. It's the environment with all its regularities and unpredictable stuff and other people who are very much like us. So this is one thing. Some, some principles should be thought about. Second, the connections in the brain, they are reciprocal. So we see all these complex networks of brain wiring. And then we see also this type of pictures where we have different levels from micro to macro level. The important thing is that there's the connections between areas and levels and they are always bidirectional. But if we think now, for example, some of you are going to hack MEG data, I guess typically we see it just like the progression in one direction. We should see also the other direction because if there's no such feedback things, people don't even get conscious about stimuli. So it, it's just like that, that stimulus goes and then finally you detect it, okay, it's speed or whatever. But it's all the time already somehow top-down uh, effects. Please try to find methods to look also at these feedback connections. They likely have a little bit um, different timing, but like uh, with current correlation methods, we, uh, <coughs> we really can't tell consistently who is leaving at a certain time. So this is one important thing. Then the third thing is inhibition. It's also it's not too much paid attention to. Typically in the fMRI, we're showing to people nice spots and we say these are activations. Look, now this part is active, this part is active. But inhibition is really important in brain function. Somebody has even said that it's among the greatest inventions in evolution, the inhibition. And it um, also some people have um, claimed that it's we have everything which comes to the brain is disynaptically already inhibitory. That means that first you get something into the brain and then there's a first synapse after that and then when it activates the next cells there will be inhibitory action. It's really abundant in the brain. It prevents the brain to go to fire so that if you if, if you send one some input there so otherwise it could spread all over the the brain and nothing could would result. And it's necessary for selecting proper motor action among a multitude of possibilities because we are very good in somehow aiming at a certain goal of our motor action. I can take this cup from here 
I have just the goal to take the cup, but I could have taken it with many ways, not only this way I did. Uh, here's one example I made just recently for another meeting. I made on my iPad, touch pad, I may wrote this with my right index finger, with my left index finger, and with my right toe. And you see that it's um, pretty similar. But what it tells, this is called motor equivalence. And it's, it's a common stuff in the brain. It tells that the motor output, which is somehow produces the behavior, is coded at a very general level. So that it can be then done in many ways. And what is important, we need to inhibit the multitude of improper movements. Number four out of six is the importance of body and behavior. So this, as you see, this is a prince who was formed, so it's now a frog because there was a witch which changed him to a frog. But it really can happen only in fairy tales is the mind is independent of the body because then in these fairy tales they are the <laughs> prince is still thinking and uh, doing everything as he used to do but really the body or the animal that means the interface to the world is extremely important it affects how these animals they get information how they're able to act and then the behavior which is quite little studied also in these brain imaging uh, environments. So this is behavior here above. You can do many things. And this is how we study it in brain imaging experiments. So it's, isn't that a little bit embarrassing? It really is that we said, yes, we gave that and this very, very fancy stimuli. And then the subject was asked to press a button when he heard some deviant stuff there or something like that. So <clears throat> I think this is also one thing uh, we really should pay att more <clears throat> attention to, to characterize the behavior in a, such a clever manner. And that's a nice paper. If, if, if you haven't yet read, so please read the paper by Vichko and co-workers in Euro 2015, where they video monitored mice and then they, they had lots of data, then they used the ma machine uh, learning algorithms to classify these different pos po uh, postures of the mice, and then they were somehow able to divide these all movements to, to <coughs> small uh, elementary movements or positions like the syllables in language. So that from these small uh, elementary postures, it was possible then to construct the whole movement. And then same thing could be basically done from video, video data of, <coughs> of humans or this motion capture data. It only has to be done because that's quite important. And then the fifth point is <coughs> we are always emphasizing the complexity of the brain. We say that it's the most complex device on the earth. And then and then we say, okay, think if there are two that kind of devices interacting, why are they the owners? It must be really com complicated. And then in like three body problem in physics is already <laughs> extremely complicated. So what happens in this lecture room is totally, um, maybe totally nonlinear. We can't predict this at all. So <clears throat> then there has been start, uh, started to be new uh, views like, like Alain Berhoz is saying that to cope with environmental complexity, human and animal brains rely or have to rely on simplifying principles that allow adaptive behavior. And that means that there's something like a, that these principles would also allow rapid processing of complex data. So that even though we have so in extremely complex brain, and interface, whatever. So there must be some simplifying principles so that we can interact with the world. 
And that means that there must be something like a <coughs> quick and maybe dirty perception so that anyhow we get to such a this or the environment very quickly. Then there must be possibility for quick and selective action so that, for example, we go can avoid danger and the system has to be flexible and reliable. And I would recommend, if you are interested, to you to read this book or look, look some, something like that uh, to learn a little bit more about these simplified uh, principles that are also very relevant for robotics. Because if we try to build some robots, so they should behave in a in such a quite a simple manner, even though there's lots of complexity inside. And the last is timing. Of course, I come from that background, so I emphasize timing. It really is like that, that we can't make sense of brain function from snapshots only, either in real time or in evolution. So if we take just like a human person, and then we study, try to understand brain function, we don't, I guess, we don't, um, we are not able to do that if we don't think about the evolution and ontogeny also, or if we think, just take snapshots like fMRI picture now, and then in the other condition, it tells us a lot, but not, not real how it goes. So the timing with all this feedback and reentrant connections, and of course all people working with um, electromagnetic uh, <coughs> phenomena, they know and they emphasize this timing, that's, that's the mo most important thing. But it's quite interesting that also people in fMRI are more and more emphasizing the importance of timing. There are pap papers in, in a neuron, uh, three years ago from Nancy Coppel's laboratory where they say, they say that beyond the connectome, the dynom, new word, and they say that we argue that how the brain generates temporal structure is critical to the ways in which signals are routed, combined and coordinated. So, couldn't agree more. And then from this uh, Calhoun's lab, so they uh, advertised another term, Connectome, the time varying connectivity networks as the next frontier in fMRI data discovery. So that we could go from this type of static pictures to really understanding what happens here in Europe, for example, between these cities and the different types of data. So, so here are my take home metaverse zone problems. So these are all such problems that I'm sure that um, we as a community can make big progress in them, if we want. So let's look at it more at these functional principles, try to think each of us about them. Then think about reciprocal connections, try to see where we see inhibition in the brain, not only excitation and activation. Remember body and behavior, then this nice um, uh, thought-provoking uh, comparison between complexity and simplexity and timing, timing, timing. Okay, this was my, my first ever unconference <laughs> talk. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I think we go next to the, immediately to the next talk. Yeah. yeah. Of course there's time for one question while we swap laptops and one question. Of course, we can talk later, but yeah. nobody asks anything. It's fine. Oh, okay. <laughs> you were so clear, everybody agreed with your principles that. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, Enrico, your video streaming thing is in danger. So I need to Yeah, you can ask. Rita, I'll ask a question. Yeah. So, there are uh, disciplines where they've already done character, character 
conversation with you and ballet and martial arts and so on. Oh, yeah, okay. So how do you propose that they would measure anything about the, the, the brain while they're doing this task? So, unfortunately, so unfortunately, I don't... Yeah, yeah, unfortunately, I'm, I don't know that about those. So, so the could person you, would be moving around freely. So how would you measure their brain? Okay, so then you need to, to have something like if you want to measure the brain at the same time, so some then some EG, <coughs> or the infrared. They kind of sweat probably as well. No, no, that's not the problem. The sweat, sweating is not the problem. It's movements are the problem. Yeah. But it's for the to do. But of course, EG is not so good with space resolution. But then that would be the way. But could you please send me a link to this, uh, this ballet, ABC? I remember this. Uh, I don't know about that person, but yeah, I dig up something. Yeah. yeah. That's the guy from um, EG Lab. What's the name? Mc McKay. 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 Yeah. yeah. That they developed something. They were also measuring basically the neck, all the neck muscles, and then with some complex ICA, they were still able to kind of remove the neck stuff, and then the person was able to walk around the space. So all the tables were kind of on the ceiling, and the person was able to move while doing EG. So. Yeah. Okay. That is. Okay, well, they also have these wireless EEG devices, battery powered, so then sure. Okay. So, very briefly, an introduction to about Lauri Parkonen, who is a professor here, and I guess all of you know who Lauri Parkonen is, and if you don't, it's fine. Uh, Lauri will also challenge our thought, I'm just, you know, giving you the mood of the day. Lauri is going to talk about also some challenges, more from uh, uh, how can I say neuroimaging and brain measuring perspective. So, stage is yours. Yeah, thanks, Enrico. Yeah, this is, uh, well, I tried to make, make this as a, a thought provoking talk, uh, and uh, in the spirit of this uh, hackathon to, to combine the computer science approach to, to brain imaging. Uh, in a very wide scope, so, so I'm totally skipping all details. I'll mostly talk about orders of magnitude rather than, than any particular uh, ways of, of uh, measuring the brain. So first, if we think that what is there to measure, uh, so our brains have about uh, 100 billion neurons, so 10 to 11 neurons, and each neuron has maybe hundreds or even thousands of, of uh, synapses or connections to other neurons. So Rita already mentioned this, this connectome in her talk. Uh, so then if we take these numbers, so we, we would have a connectome which have, has maybe uh, 10 to 14 elements in it. So this is of course now just the structure part. Then uh, if we think about the activity in this network, let's say that we just now focus on the action potentials. There are of course other kinds of things too, but I'll come to those. Uh, just in a minute. Uh, the cells can typically fire uh, action potentials maybe up to 500 hertz or so. That's maybe a little bit of an ex exception already, but, uh, but rates at 100, 200 hertz, so that's not so unusual. So now if you take this kind of a rate, uh, all the neurons we have, and then just compute the information flow that could there could be in the brain at maximum. So that could be something like 10 to 13 or 10 to 14 bits per second. So that means that you would fill a one terabyte hard disk in one second, every second. So that's pretty uh, huge amount of, of, of data. Okay, and even with these large numbers, so this is not as simple because, well, one thing is that the connectome is not stable. When we learn things, the connections change. They may change at least to some degree in uh, uh, relatively short time scales. Not this short, but uh, but within uh, minutes, let's say, or, or even a couple of seconds. Uh, and then the other thing which I already hinted at, action potentials are of course not the only thing. You can't describe the state of the brain by just knowing uh, what is the rate of action potentials or whether there is an action potential in, in a particular neuron or not. So there are, of course, uh, all the pharmacological things, uh, what you have in the dendrites, which kind of potentials, how far you are from the threshold of firing an action potential, all these things uh, uh, 
contribute to the state of the brain. But just for simplicity, if we uh, just assume that action potentials would be the thing, we already get this, this kind of high numbers. Um, Rita also showed this nice picture in one of her slides from the Human Brain Project. So if you think about the scales at which we could describe uh, brain, first uh, thinking about the structure, uh, so we can go down to synapses or, or uh, ion channels, uh, and then from there all the way to the, uh, to the entire nervous system. So that's uh, at least seven or eight orders of magnitude. But what is a little bit surprising maybe is that if you think about the time, uh, we have even wider span of, of uh, orders of magnitude. So there are uh, very relevant things happening at the sub-millisecond uh, scale, even down to microseconds, and then of course we should consider at least the lifespan of the person, and that already gives us more than 10 orders of magnitude in terms of timing uh, scale differences. And then what Rita also mentioned that, that in order to understand how the brain works, we need to take into account the way the brain has evolved. So ho the whole evolutionary perspective, of course, then adds a couple of orders of magnitude here too. Now, many of us here are doing non-invasive neuroimaging. Uh, so the scales that we can address with the tools, so we can go maybe from a millimeter to the entire brain uh, in the space hall scales. So that's a very uh, small fraction of the span of the orders that we have here. And then in timing, with MEG and EEG, we can go to millisecond, uh, and then we can measure the person maybe up to an hour or something like that. Of course, we can repeat the measurement over consecutive days or weeks or even years, but in a, in a typical single shot experiment, we are spanning this uh, these scales. Then, uh, so what I did for this presentation is that I tried to estimate how much data do we get from each of these Im imaging modalities. And this is of course now just, as I said in the beginning, just an order of magnitude thing. So don't take the numbers uh, too literally. So first, uh, functional MRI. That's of course, as I, think, I hope, almost, or everyone knows here, so it's an indirect measure, measure of the metabolism that is of course connected to, to brain function. It's relatively slow compared to the other methods that I'm going to talk about, but it has high spatial resolution and it gives us a view to the entire brain at once. Now if we think about the data we get from this method, so with uh, sort of high-end imaging parameters, uh, shown here, the data rate would be something on the order of uh, 100 kilobits or 1 megabit per second. Uh, this is a little bit difficult to estimate because of course you can just take the file that is produced by the, by the imaging device, but this is not the whole thing because there could be a lot of redundancy. It doesn't mean that if you increase your, say, number of pixels or voxels that you would uh, get more information uh, in a linear relationship with the number of voxels. Um, but anyway, it's just an order of magnitude thing. So then, if we do the same thing with MEG, so that's a direct measure, and it's fast compared to, to fMRI, has border spatial resolution. Uh, the field of view is also more narrow. We have uh, ability to get data from most of the cortex, in some rare cases also from deeper structures, but, but that's more of an exception. So if we do the same kind of uh, calculation or estimation, uh, MEG, as it's done in a conventional way, has about 100 degrees of freedom. The device might have 300 channels, but, uh, but if you, for example, do a principal component analysis, you can explain pretty much all the data with, uh, with about 100 components. The rest uh, are about at the noise level of the, of the system. So then if we sample at half a kilohertz, use 8 bits per sample, so we end up with rather similar data rates as with fMRI. It's just a little surprising, but, uh, but anyway. Of course, fMRI provides more stuff on the spatial dimension and less in the temporal, and then in MEG it's the um, other way around. 
Then, uh, if we think about invasive recordings, uh, and there are, of course, now uh, many variants, you can do corticography, so put grids on the cortex, like shown in this picture here, so they are just on the brain surface, uh, and the, the, the spacing between the electrodes is, it could be even 10 millimeters, in some cases a bit smaller. Then there is stereo EEG or stereotactic EEG, where you implant needle-like electrodes that have multiple contacts. Uh, and then there are also these uh, so-called buta arrays. Here's one picture. So that's a small device, but very uh, dense uh, electrode grid. Uh, so it can, can have 10 by 10 a matrix of electrodes, but just one square centimeter of, of area. And that is then uh, punched into the, to the cortex. And then you can record simultaneously from all of these contacts. OK, so all of these are, of course, invasive techniques. Um, and typically, the number of channels is somewhere around 100. Uh, the sampling rate is usually a little higher because we can record also faster phenomena than with the non-invasive techniques. Uh, the data weight is maybe one megabit per second. Uh, then, uh, thinking about the microscopic uh, microscopic methods. Two-photon microscopy is a relatively recent technique invented in the 90s. Uh, although the principle was, was uh, suggested over much earlier. So that's an indirect recording. Uh, you put in dyes which uh, could reflect the concentration of a certain compound or, or uh, electric potential differences. It's an invasive technique. You typically do in slice preparations, or, or, but you can also do it in behaving uh, small animals. The field of view is much narrower, so maybe up to uh, half a millimeter at maximum, but usually people are imaging a lot smaller structures. You can even look at individual axons or dendrites or synaptic spines. Uh, there, these are now uh, partly my guesses, so then forgive my ignorance if they are off, but the image matrix could be something on the order of 100 times 100 uh, pixels. Um, uh, images can be acquired uh, at the time resolution of maybe 10 milliseconds or so, so 100 hertz. Uh, and <coughs> together, this could yield a little bit higher data rate than the non-invasive method, so 10 megabits per second or so. Okay, so then the point here is not to compare these imaging methods against one another, but if we think about what I estimated in the beginning, that we have 10 to 13 or 14 bits per second, and we can only capture 10 to 5 or 10 to 7 bits. So that's miserably low number, thinking about what's going on in the brain. So we can maybe measure one millionth of, of what's going on. So that doesn't sound too good. Of course, you can ask that whether it's necessary to go any better than that. But what is then most difficult in, in imaging? Um, of course, opinions vary, but I would say that it's the mesoscopic scale, so from circuits uh, to cortical columns or, or so. The reason for that is that uh, what I think is that at the microscopic end, so at the level of single neurons, so there's just a finite number of different kinds of synapses and, and neurons, and, and uh, we could consider those as kind of the building blocks which are this is now oversimplification, but, but just uh, putting uh, many of these blocks together, so that would give us a, a, a larger uh, structure. Then, in the other end, uh, if we think about the macroscopic part, so the neuroimaging devices that we have, we can have the entire brain there. But the area in between is the, is the tricky part. So we can do, for example, this two-photon microscopy, but in a very limited, spatially very limited, uh, area. So, do we need more information to understand how the brain works? Or, let's say, do we need all the information that there could be to understand how the brain works? Hopefully not, and likely not. <coughs> so you could think of how much information you would need to understand how a computer works. Uh, and I would say that you don't need to be able to follow every uh, bit at every 
million, billion of a, of a second to understand the, the working uh, principles if, if you didn't know them. Uh, there was uh, two years ago a nice study in, in, uh, in, in class computational biology by, by Jones and Cording. The title was Could a Neuroscientist Understand a Microprocessor? And they had reverse engineered uh, an 8 bit. Uh, uh, 6502 microprocessor, which uh, Apple One and uh, I think Commodore 64 and all these so-called home com computers in the 80s were were, were using. Uh, just to put it that in comparison with uh, the data rates that are just computed for the imaging tools, their simulation model produced about uh, uh, 10 to 10 bits per second. So it was much higher data rate than, than what the imaging methods can, can provide us with. Still, they could not figure out uh, from the data that they got from the simulation model how the processor works. Well, of course, they knew, but, but they could not have done that based on the data they recorded from the, uh, from the simulator. This is just one example. That's the, uh, the chip of the, of the microprocessor. And then there are certain regions that they had picked up, and then they uh, computed what could be called local field potential, as we measure from the brain. We stick an electrode in the uh, extracellular space, and then uh, uh, at a certain frequency band, so then we we estimate the uh, local field potentials. And these are the traces, the LFP traces from these five regions, and then the power spectra. And this looks basically like the power spectra you would get from the brain, except that the frequency axis is, of course, different because that's operating in the megahertz range rather than in the, say, 10 to 100 hertz range. Okay, but the conclusion from that study was that uh, even with this data rate, uh, if you don't know the uh, underlying principles, it's really hard to figure out what's going on. So that brings us or me to the importance of using models. And I picked an example from a very different field of science. Uh, so now I guess you are all aware that, that uh, uh, people have been able to detect exoplanets, so planets around stars other than our own sun. Now directly observing these planets is really difficult. And not just because they are so far and, and close to, to the star they belong to, but because of the luminance difference. So of course, those planets are also reflecting the light of the uh, the light of the star, but the star itself is so much brighter that it's it, it's more or less impossible to observe them, uh, at least from the surface of the Earth. So then, uh, astronomers astronomers uh, uh, devised a number of indirect methods to. Uh, to prove the existence of, of these planets. And one of them uh, was to look at the orbit of the star, because that we can track fairly uh, accurately. And then they noticed that, that there is a periodic uh, shifting in the radial velocity, and that's a span of uh, uh, three years now. And this could be explained by the gravity that is exerted by the planet to the star. So of course it's a very small thing because the star has so much more mass than, than the planet, but, but nevertheless it, it still has an effect, albeit small. And now by building a model and then making a prediction uh, with that model and then fitting that with the experimental data, so then uh, people could deduce that there must be uh, these, these planets around the star. And I think that's a very nice example of how you could make a lot more sense of your data by having good models that reflect the system. So now, what that could mean in, in our domain. So I just build a sort of a caricature recipe. So then we should first find the governing principles and common building blocks that in cosmology that would be the, uh, what are the objects in the, in the space, how they interact with one another and so forth. Then we should do some generative modeling, so how each one of these entities would manifest its activity in the data we get, no matter what the imaging uh, modality we are using. So that's the same thing as, as knowing uh, what are uh, 
what's the data from this uh, uh, object in the space that we can observe and how that relates to their uh, their movement, for example. So then we need to get some data, perform measurements, and then put all this together, so fit the model with, with, uh, with the data. And then we have a result. I think this is now an important part because, well, so many times it has gone wrong. So the interpretation has to be done with great care, uh, simply because uh, if we do not know the what is behind step one, so then you can always create models that, that do fit with the data, but it doesn't mean that, that the, those models are correct. So step one is already very, very difficult. And uh, well, we are here for the, for the hackathon, so then all fresh ideas how to, how to do these things uh, at step one, but also in the other steps are, of course, things that could advance the field, and I'll leave you with that quote, so thank you. I have a question from the yes. last, can we do them all in parallel rather than <laughs> sequentially, you know? We just start measuring and start yeah. fitting models that are wrong, and uh, this, is, this, is, this is basically what's happening already. <laughs> yes, yeah, it is, it is what is happening. I think there is the point that, that, that Rita brought up that uh, if we just collect data uh, without an underlying hypothesis, so it might be good, but it may also, I mean, there's a greater danger that, that we have problems at this stage, because then we are tend to, to just use our models, which may not be entirely correct, with the data that is actually collected for a different purpose. And then we do get a combination, but then how much that actually explains it. That's even harder to say. If you want, there's time for another short question while Arthur is taking up. Yeah, I think we should should be able to improve uh, the non-invasive techniques to have better spatial resolution. That's what we are trying to do here. Uh, and then on the other hand, also for the non-invasive techniques, like two photon microscopy type of things, which actually do span quite uh, large uh, variation of spatial scale. So you can do go down to micrometers but then you can also image this, uh, uh, well, up to half a millimeter or something like that. So, so that's quite a large span already for a single method. So I think something like that, we, we still need more to, to bring these two ends uh, even closer to each other. But to bridge between these scales, so I would advocate this, uh, this modeling approach, because otherwise I think it's really hard we will probably never have a complete coverage of all the scales by experimental techniques, that the models still need to be there in between. We just need to be very careful in which way we model, how we interpret the models, and, and that we simplify the models in, a, in an appropriate manner. Because It's probably not necessary to model uh, in a whole brain model. We don't need to model each individual neuron with with the 100 differential equations. We can probably do it with much less, but the problem is that we don't know how to correctly simplify it, and, but I mean, so, so that we keep the essential features in the simplified model, because we don't yet know what are the essential features, and, and that's exactly why this point one in my recipe is so difficult even today. Thank you, Lauri. And now it's the last talk of our own conference, so that you got inspired, after that we can have a break. And it's Professor Arto Klami, <laughs> who is right now in uh, computer science in Helsinki yes. University. Yes. And he's, uh, he's been working with uh, brain data and complex methods and 
models for the brain and the stage is yours with the challenging question can you know artificial intelligence will be reading your mind or not thanks Enrico so I see that I recognize roughly half of the faces so some of you know me I used to hang around in Alto uh, I did some work with the previous speakers as well uh, but what I am is a computer scientist I know nothing about the brain uh, it's just somewhere out there but of course what my, my job is is to figure out any unknown system based on some data we can collect about it so of course I should be able to figure out how brain works just as well as anything else uh, and of course what, what I mean by mind reading is that I mean given access to the brain somehow figure out emotions, desires, intentions, thoughts of a person but I mean, if we can do this, then we understand enough about the brain. From my perspective, I don't need to know how brain functions if I'm able to figure out what's going on in the brain of another person. Uh, I do need data, so we just need to record the data, uh, the brain, in any way possible. Uh, I've only touched the non-invasive non techniques during my career, so I assume that's, that's roughly what we do. So the question is, how hard can this be? And we heard some uh, arguments that it may be hard. I have the counter argument that I mean, we have already solved problems of roughly the same order of complexity, uh, namely computer vision. So if I put here in place of me a robot that has a camera facing towards you, and I can ask that robot to tell what's going on in this room. Of course, there's a lot of information about what's happening in the room. It's not that there's kind of 30 people. It's who old you are, how old you are, who you are, what's this occasion. So there's kind of, I mean, I couldn't even start describing the amount of bits there is about the state of the world. But what we can do nowadays is that I can give this image to a computer, an artificial intelligence system, and it will tell that yes, there is a car here, there's a dog here, with very high probabilities, absolutely certain that there is a car, there is a person sitting on top of a horse, and so on. So this problem is more or less solved. We can have an artificial intelligence system that only sees the pixel image, and is able to tell what's going on there, or it can even kind of write you textual description of what's happening here. So it says, man in black shirt is playing guitar. <laughs> this exists, you can go to Google and find off the self models that more or less do this. With some accuracy, of course, I mean, it's not perfect. Uh, we can even go a bit further. I mean, you just have an image that's been corrupted by elements that are missing, nothing else. And you can ask the artificial intelligence algorithm to fill in the missing pieces. And it's going to give you a picture that looks pretty much as if it was a photograph of this room. With no other information uh, besides just knowing that this kind of, I mean, it is able to realize that there is some beam that has to continue, but in these areas you have to have some books and it's going to invent you new books to fill, fill these to ourselves. And of course how this is done is that you simply assume a flexible machine learning model, some class of models, and you assume that you have a lot of data, a lot of training data of these possible input-output pairs for any given task, whether it's writing descriptions of what is happening in the image, or whether it's about uh, filling in the missing pieces, you need to collect a separate training data uh, of these input-output pairs. This is an example already from 20 years ago of what's roughly happening. So you're throwing an image in here and here out comes what is in this image, that it's a letter A. And what I'm arguing is that reading the mind is just the same thing. Uh, you take an image of the brain with whatever you want to use, fMRI, uh, MEG, uh, and the outputs, they are governed by your experiment that you carried out. Uh, if I want to read the mind, uh, in the simplest case that I mean, what was I watching when this recording was made? I mean, we can just collect this data and train these models and, and do it. And the important thing is that the models we use for the computer vision, they are pretty much black boxes. They don't assume any knowledge about the world. So here we don't need to assume any knowledge about how the brain works either. Some regularity conditions like 
spatial continuity is assumed for the computer vision, but nothing else. And of course, this has been done. People have been doing this for 15 years. So stepping a bit outside the process of trying to understand how the brain works and just switching to predictive models. Uh, don't try to read the titles or anything. The important thing is that I mean, this thing started around 2004, 2005 with experiments where you try to predict that someone is watching a, a picture of a, an object and you try to classify that what is this object that they are seeing. Uh, a bit later, uh, people were looking at that, okay, you're watching a naturalistic video, I want to reconstruct the video. I think I picked up uh, simply three of the labs where uh, I think most of the leading solutions came <coughs> around that time. And the same groups are doing this thing, this thing still. So they started 10, 15 years ago, but I just picked up some random papers from the, their websites uh, from the last year, two years. Same people working on the same problem, so it's clearly interesting for them, but apparently they haven't fully solved it in, in 10 to 15 years. Uh, Maybe part of the reason why I'm here speaking is that, of course, we've been doing this thing in Helsinki as well. Uh, so, uh, but not with fMRI, most of the other stuff was with fMRI. We're doing these things with MEG, decoding what is happening in the brain of a person when they are, for example, listening to natural uh, audio streams. And maybe I think the more important things actually, are, the more interesting things are things that are getting closer to reading the mind is that we had some works where we're trying to figure out whether the person is interested in the content they're right now seeing. So trying to already figure something else than just decoding the stimulus itself. The question is of course, do these things work? Can we actually figure out what is going on in the mind of a person? So this is from one of these uh, early reconstruction works from 2011 from Gallant's lab. You show a movie for the user, and this is what the algorithm tells that it tries to reconstruct uh, what was happening in that particular frame in this movie. Who would think that these look like good reconstructions? A few of you. Uh, the thing is that they are cheating a lot. What they actually do is that they figure, find out in existing videos frames that uh, would probably cause similar brain activation pattern, and then they just construct this by averaging these out. If you would look at this, it doesn't look like a reconstruction of this. What's happening is that if you smooth out things uh, enough by averaging out a lot of individual bad predictions, you get something that looks nice. So what they're actually doing is that's kind of a magic magician's trick or sleight of hand in some sense, that I mean, you can fool the readers to believe that they saw an impressive reconstruction because we are so good at interpreting that this looks like a person. We didn't actually do much. I mean, it didn't recognize what kind of a person there was, who it was, or even what was the color of the skin or anything. Uh, the other argument that why why people focus so much on reconstructing images is that that somewhere on the visual cortex you do have these edge detectors and elements that you have more or less already have uh, the image copied somewhere there. So you don't actually have to read the mind. You just check what's happening on the visual cortex. In general, if I take a look at all of these works that people have done, uh, they tend to be very well chosen tasks with suitably chosen evaluation metrics that make things look impressive. People are decoding the stimulus itself not the thoughts of a person. Uh, you're trying to reconstruct things and just show them and hope that people see that, oh, this is impressive, instead of actually having something that you can quantify that it, it's good. But of course, uh, things have moved onwards in 15 years from my perspective. So in machine learning, we nowadays have tools, forget the brain, uh, brain activations for a while, tools for generating content that could be used uh, for a kind of decoding of the, of the whatever you're seeing. This is an example of a fake Shakespeare uh, generated by a recurrent neural network. It looks a bit like uh, something that has a dialogue between different persons. It's not really intelligible thing, but it still looks fancy. 
like I said, I mean, we are able to fool people to see, see, feel that this is impressive, even though it doesn't really resemble Shakespeare. Uh, with images, we can do slightly better. So this is a collection of eight completely artificial faces of celebrities. These people do not exist. Uh, it's from Aalto University, actually, uh, Aalto and uh, NVIDIA Research. Uh, it's being presented in one of the premium conferences today in Vancouver. You train a model to generate artificial uh, faces of celebrities. You can do it. I mean, I wouldn't be able to tell if there was one real celebrity uh, inside here somewhere. So the question is that if we plug in these advances in the machine learning field to the brain mind reading things, of course people have started doing this as well. So this is from 2017 from uh, Kamitani's lab in Japan. You simply have here a more complex model in place of the simple models that people used uh, uh, 10 years ago. Here's the result. Uh, this is the stimulus that the person was seeing. This is the kind of a reconstruction with the old methods. This is the reconstruction with the better methods. Uh, yes, it looks fancier. I don't think it's any better. I mean, it's still not, this is an owl. This, to me, this looks like a dog here. This looks just like a blob, blob of something. So yes, you can plug in better methods, but it's not going to solve uh, the problem as such. Uh, the reason why it's not enough is that there are some hidden things behind that why we were able to more or less solve the computer vision problem. And the one big thing is the amount of data. At 2010, we were miserably bad in recognizing objects in images. In 2015, we reached more or less human accuracy in detecting which objects there are. The main reason was that in 2010, people released the first truly big data set for training these models. All of the models for generating text or machine translation are trained on gigabytes and gigabytes of text. I mean, the web is full of text. It's very easy to get that. And there is even a quote that, I mean, you need something like in the order of 100,000 training examples before you see any progress because of the better methods. And of course, there's a lot of computation happening as well. Uh, but maybe that's not, I mean, you're used to handling with a lot of uh, technical requirements. And the other hidden truth is that the computer vision actually doesn't work either. This is an example, it's a bit hard to see from a, bit, uh, a couple of years ago, that if you ask from this kind of models, so that give me an image that uh, is best classified, uh, is kind of as much re representing dumbbells as well as you can, what it produces is this kind of, so you have a couple of dumbbells here, and then you have arms always holding those dumbbells. This is because in the training data you always have someone uh, pumping up the iron. So it doesn't actually learn what a dumbbell is. It just learns the statistical properties in whatever training data you have. So this is kind of a, a challenge. This is a very low resolution because it's from a couple of years ago when we still worked with low resolution images. So it's not bad quality on my slides. Uh, another example that why the computer vision doesn't actually really work, this is a real result. Uh, where well, these are all images that the network is classifying with high probability as ostrich, these birds. <laughs> it's absolutely sure that all of these are birds. And what has been done is that you actually have, it actually did correct predictions for all of these images, but you add a tiny amount of variation, carefully selected variation to fool the model. This is called an adversarial uh, example, that you construct an image that is, looks for a human exactly the same. But in the minds of the model, uh, it is now an ostrich. You could, of course, do this for any imaginable class. So you can fool any of these models perfectly well, because it's not really modeling what's happening in the image. It's just a very good classifier. So let's see how close, to we are, close we are to these kind of things, what we have in computer vision in the deep uh, mind reading uh, uh, brain research work. 
by looking at the data acquisition in many of these works. So if you start from the early years, you had these kind of a, a few subjects that were viewing a few training instances and then to train a model. Here we are at the level of the video example I showed. This is our work, by the way. So you have seven subjects listening to an hour of natural audio. These are the 2007 What's the alarming thing here? If you look at this list that goes from 2004 to 2017. Well, yeah, well, I would say that there's simply no progress whatsoever. We still have three to ten subjects. We still have in the ballpark of thousand at most, at most roughly thousand individual instances per subject for training these things. So if we have this quote that you start to see benefit from better, more flexible models from 100,000 onwards, here we are at most in the ballpark of 10,000 examples. At least an order of magnitude difference to the lower limit of where it makes sense to start working with more flexible models. I, this was a bit of a surprise to me. I thought that they would have gone up a bit, but not really even that, so there's no progress. Uh, and I mean, it's not others to blame. I mean, the, our work is here in the middle. So what I think that will happen in the near future, I think that someone will simply invest a lot of resources to collect a bigger data set of the same style. Then they will be able to plug in the better models. They will start with a vision. So they let, let's say, 100 users watch tens of hours of videos record fMRI or something, and then they will be able to replicate the feeds that these guys did earlier so that they look much better. And at that point, I would say that we are more or less able to read in the stimulus itself uh, from the non-invasive uh, frame activ activation measurements roughly at the level that it is possible to do in general. But of course, we can't say anything else. So there's these orders of magnitude gaps of what's actually going on in the brain and what we can measure. Uh, one good question is that whether it is already happening. This is news from uh, Sunday, where China reports that they are actually putting EEG helmets on, on, on the construction workers on the scale of tens of thousands of workers wearing these helmets 24-7, so that 24-7, but all the time they are working, to be able to monitor now this person is having a nervous breakdown, let's take them off from the construction site. Uh, I don't think this is going to solve, this is not going to be the highlight we have here, because I don't think they are collecting training material for these. They still probably trained on one of these very simple experiments where they have five subjects uh, uh, in a controlled lab, lab experiment, and then they just put it in production, that they just say, and it's not going to work very well. But someone will do it. Someone will collect training data for these models on this scale as well. That's my two cents on the subject. Thank you, Arto. Any questions? Anybody? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this might sound like an ironic question, but I'm actually serious. Uh, what do you think? Uh, so why do we need to read the mind, as, as you put it? Oh yeah, uh, I have no idea why we would want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like I said, I mean, these people are actually not reading the mind. You are decoding the stimulus itself. It, yeah. It's a. You could think of it as, of course, as a tool in some sense. If you are, if you are able to do that you must have learned something about how the brain works. Not necessarily very much, but it possibly is, you could think of it as another lens to how you study the brain. Of course, this is a practical thing you could do. That I mean, if you are able to put in, let's say, EEG helmets uh, on top of you, and you are able to somehow boost, I mean, recognize emotions or uh, tiredness or something, which is not really mind reading, uh, but that kind of, uh, but yeah, uh, Telepathy would be nice, of course, if you could read real, actual, real thoughts and then communicate them for someone else. But that's science fiction, you know. Uh, when when talking about creating like this kind of like 
let's say machine or robot that could uh, reliably and uh, kind of like mimic human behavior, it could kind of like pass the Turing test. Do you think we're limited by software or hardware in that aspect? Uh, or both? Both, but probably more by software. Uh, I mean, we can always have hardware kind of near infinite amounts. So if you think about that, say, the, you probably read the news about AlphaGo, that you are able to beat the Go play, best Go players there. They said that, yeah, we trained it in a couple of days. Of course, they trained it in a couple of days on pretty much all the hardware that Google has. But I mean, you can always kind of put more resources on at least demonstrating something. And once it's been demonstrated, someone will find a way of making it commercially plausible or whatever. I think the software is kind of by far the bigger bottleneck here. Okay. Yep. Thank you, Arto. And thank you, everybody. Let's have now a. Now it's 11 11. The next section is not going to be too long because there are Ignite talks, five, quite short, five minutes. Maybe let's come back here at 11.25. Okay, is that enough?